Hello everyone, so it's Humane Hancock here. Welcome to my third podcast episode and today I'm talking with Professor Cullum Brown. Now Cullum is a university professor who specializes in fish cognition and fish behavior. One of the important things we discussed in our conversation is the public's perception of fish intelligence and fish sentience and the scientific reality. These two things seem to be worlds apart. I think even in the animal advocacy community, the welfare of fishes is an extremely neglected topic. I think most vegans probably don't really understand what's going on uh, in commercial fishing and aquaculture. And it's, it's understandable because not many people are talking about this. It's a very neglected area in animal advocacy. I think some of the research that Cullum takes us through is really fascinating and is really gonna surprise a lot of people. Now, one of the things I find really endearing about Cullum is that he is a scientist who is entering the realm of ethics. He spent years learning about the cognitive capacities of fish and the sentience of fish. And then he looked at what we're doing to them and he, he felt compelled to start doing something about it and to start raising awareness about fish sentience and about what we're doing to fish because so many people are unaware of this. Like I said, even in the animal advocacy movement, we're really unaware, I think, of the, the true capacities of, of fishes and what's actually happening to them in aquaculture and with commercial fishing. Now this is me we're talking about, so of course I did take the opportunity to talk to Cullum about wild animal suffering. We talked about the distinction between the perspective of the individual and the perspective of the species or the ecosystem, and we challenged each other at times. I thought it was a really, really interesting discussion. But that's enough of me discussing the discussion. I think the best thing I can do is to shut up and let you listen to the conversation. So here is Professor Cullum Brown. Well, the other thing is I tend to need to go to the toilet quite a lot. I must have like a, the bladder of a fish or something. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you actually put... Can. Huh? <laughs> You've got a Coke can there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I can... I don't want to sound um, arrogant, but I'm not sure I can fit my penis into that little thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you what know... Bottle, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going to edit that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start by just talking a bit about your life. How did you get involved in studying fish behavior and fish cognition? Yes, well, I mean, my my life was um, an interesting one because as a child, my father lived overseas um, in all sorts of countries around the world, North America and Europe. But eventually we, we ended up spending most of our time in Southeast Asia. So I spent a huge amount of time in and around some really pristine reefs, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, some of those reefs in Southeast Asia were incredible. So I just spent a crazy amount of time snorkeling from a very young age on these pristine reefs. Um, and I guess that's what really captured my imagination. I've always been in love with the water. Um, I don't care if I'm underwater or on the water or anything like that, but that early experience really set in motion my love for the for the ocean and um, particularly the fishes that are living in it. So you spent a lot of time around fish um, yep. and this did you empathize with them? Did you have any emotional connection to them? What was your relationship to fish like at this point in your life when you were young? Well when I was young I had a, a, a real emotional connection to all animals not just fishes. I mean I I think I connected with fishes because you know many of them on those reefs are absolutely spectacular and I spent so much time watching them that I, I think I understood them. Uh, I had a much better idea of the sorts of crazy behaviours that they were doing uh, in their natural environment whereas most people well either they have no experience with wild fishes at all or you know maybe they have a fish tank at home or something like that but you know, although small fishes can do some interesting things in fish tanks it's nothing compared to what you see when they're swimming around in their natural environment so again I, I used to run out as a kid and rescue cicadas and free flies and mosquitoes and <laughs> wasps and spiders from the house and let them go outside and so I was I always had that um, empathy for animals across the board didn't matter what animal it was but um, I had that particular connection with fish because of that experience mm -hmm. Where I guess I'm similar to you is that when I was young, I very clearly had a, I had a lot of empathy for animals as well. I mean, my brother used to say that I, that I empathized more with animals than did with humans. <laughs> um, but yeah. where we where we differ is that I didn't really have any experience with wild fish at all, mm. at all. We had mm. some 
uh, my parents bought some fish that we had in a fish tank that they didn't last very long because I think they combined the wrong species of fish and it was it was chaos. Um, but no, I didn't really spend any time with with wild fish. And this brings us on to like a broader question of the the scale of human interaction with fish. And I suppose there's a lot of misconceptions with this. I mean, most of us go through our daily lives without really thinking about fish. What are some of the, yeah. the ways that humans interact with the different fishes? Well, I mean, I think people would be shocked, uh, frankly. Uh, I mean, the first, I guess the first and foremost is that there are large numbers of countries, Pacific, Pacific Islands and, and lots of Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian countries with, that rely heavily on wild capture of fishes for absolutely for survival. I mean, they have almost no other source of protein. Mm -hmm. um, but even if you disregard those subsistence um, societies, the actual intake of fish protein worldwide is going up and it's going up faster than our global population. So our mean intake is actually increasing. Um, now, part of the problem, of course, is that our wild stocks just can't handle that. So, you know, commercial fishing now is basically collapsing, which is problematic. But the number of fish that are still captured to this day um, is estimated to be between one and three trillion individual fishes, which is just, I mean, that's mind blowing those numbers. Um, if you think about terrestrial agriculture, production of of uh, chickens, for example, I think we eat about 90 billion odd, um, which if you think about that, it's like it seems trivial compared to how many fish. Mm -hmm. So commercial fishing is still massive and heavily subsidised. So that's, a, that's an obvious thing. And I guess to some extent, because wild stocks are collapsing, in the last four or five years, um, food production from aquaculture has actually overtaken um, wild stocks. So that's the first time that's obviously ever happened. And what that means is that like terrestrial agriculture, aquaculture is becoming industrialised. It's, it's now massive and growing exponentially, um, largely to fill the void that commercial fishes have fallen out of. So that, those two things are, you know, are all about eating fish, really. Um, after that, of course, you have recreational fishing. Now, Recreational fishing in the UK is massive. It's also huge in, in Australia, in the US, um, all throughout the Nordic. Um, so, you know, they have uh, a huge political um, clout in Australia, believe it or not. Um, they often pair up with the Conservatives um, and have all sorts of policies about encouraging recreational fishing and, and recreational fishing-based businesses and stuff like that. And it's actually it's actively pushed by the federal and state governments over here. Um, so wreck fishing is huge as a, as a pastime. Most kids, you know, by the time they're teenagers will have been recreational fishing in Australia in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So it's huge. After that, probably the next biggest impact um, on fishes and the way humans interact with fishes is pet fish. Um, People will be shocked to discover that actually fish are the most numerous pets in the world. Um, and it's, a, it's again, a massive industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge in Southeast Asia. They export to the world, um, but also equally in Europe. Um, places like Germany, they're crazy about um, fish keeping. So that's, that's an extremely popular pastime. And, in fact, you know, the number of fish involved it's, it's more than cats and dogs combined easily. And that's because when people keep fish, they don't have one fish. They tend to have, you know, 10 fish or 15 fish or something like that. Um, in terms of the number of people who actually have fish, it's, it's actually second after cats and dogs. So that more people have cats and dogs. Um, did you say, then, did, sorry to interrupt. Did you say fish camping? Fish camping? <laughs> I hope not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to clarify what that was. But yeah, you t I thought you were talking about just like the, the pet industry and I thought I had the word fish camping and I was like, what the hell is fish camping? <laughs> like other people, other listeners must be thinking about this too. But yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to do apologies. Um, so we've got, we've got the <laughs> fish for food. We've got, fish for food. Uh, we've got the recreational pet, fishing. Recreational fishing and we've got the pet industry. Is that, is that the main yes. bulk of it? Well, no, of course, we also have um, scientific research. So, 
you know, over the last probably decade, I'd say, um, increasingly scientific research is ditching mice and, and rats. So rodents are out and zebrafish and, and similar type species are the, the new rodents for scientific research. And I guess it'll shock people to discover that um, a lot of medical research designed to, you know, understand you know, problems with people and finding resolutions with our health, uh, a lot of that research is now done with fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is surprising, right? Because we see fish as being the, the type of animal that is perhaps furthest away from us. And it makes sense to use an animal for research that's more like us, so that it's yeah. more relevant yeah. to us. Yeah, so I mean, it used to be monkeys, and then uh, rodents were the new monkeys, and now fish are the new rodents. <laughs> and that's, that's largely because um, if, you, if you look at the way our um, physiology works the, and anatomy and, and all that kind of thing, it's, it's essentially identical. It's all, it's all like a, a vertebrate template. So it's pretty much does the same thing, slightly different formats, but effectively the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's surprising, I suppose, to think that the, the, the scale of fish, is, let's just look at the food industry. If you're saying that the majority of animals being killed are animals from the ocean, mm -hmm. that seems strange when you consider the fact that we don't really consider fishes like we consider land animals. Even in the vegan community, actually, we talk a lot more about land animals than we do about fishes. Why are we considering fish so much less than we consider land animals? Yeah, look, it's, a, it's an odd question. And um, you know, if you speak to a lot of animal welfare, animal rights, uh, NGOs and, and stuff like that, they all admit that they basically dropped the ball when it came to fish welfare. And I think that's because... Well, to be honest, in the early days, they were just going for the cute and fairy, you know, the, the mm. pulling the heartstrings to make people care about animals. And I suspect that worked. Um, you know, if you think of World Wildlife Fund, I mean, they have a panda on, on their logo, right? And, I mean, people go for things that, you know, are going to draw the most empathy. And to be honest and, and fair to them, I suppose, people don't look at a trout and feel empathy. Um, and, and that's that's understandable because we don't we don't interact with fishes in the same way that we interact with terrestrial animals, um, and, and they're much harder to relate to, I think, unless you've had the kind of experience and upbringing that I had, um, which means that you can understand them and, and relate to them and, and have empathy for them in probably at a higher level than most. But that's that's one of the reasons they're basically out of sight, out of mind. Right. Um, and I also reckon that. Um, there's this underlying problem with um, education, which is like a, a pseudo Christian approach to science, which has fishes at the bottom of the tree and humans and, mm. and the angels and God at the top, you know, and, and that, believe it or not, is still taught in most schools to this day. The idea that humans are more evolved than fishes or other species of animals. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the way that, you know, they, they often have this sort of tiered approach to, to vertebrates in particular, and fishes are inevitably at the bottom. Maybe you can quickly debunk debunk that idea for us. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the first thing is that that is not how evolution works mm -hmm. at all. Um, it's not tiered. Uh, it's not progressive. Um, there is, you know, if we went back in time and, and replayed, there's certainly no guarantee that humans would ever even emerge. It's, mm. it's literally... Um, chance events. Um, but more importantly, you know, a modern view of, of evolution and diversity is it's not about tiered progression to, to humans. It's about basically animals radiating out into different, um, I guess, niches and filling those niches. Uh, and if you want to think about it from a, you know, a sort of historical perspective, most of the bony fish that we are familiar with today evolved around about the same time as, as humans did. So most of the, the perch that we see and, and, and associate with, with modern fish, they're not ancient. They evolved around the same time as we do. It's just that, you know, <clears throat> the fishy-like ancestor goes back 600 million years. But, you know, strictly speaking, humans are just 
a fish as well with a few tweaks basically and actually from a classification perspective where we're, we're lobe fin fishes right so we, we evolved from a uh, a fishy ancestor that just happened to have lobe fins instead of ray, ray fins. But you don't have to go far back before those two things join together as well. So we're all fish um, is the take home message. <laughs> and that, that explains why um, from a medical research perspective, people are using zebra fish now, you know, to solve just about any, any question you can think of. Right. Maybe we should make the argument that eating fish is cannibalism and therefore it's oh, that, we should that stop would sell. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> sounds like something peter might do the organization <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> oh yeah i can imagine it now <laughs> um so i mean fish aren't even included in animal welfare legislation i mean this is this is such an insane thing to imagine you know and it's 2021 and the way we're treating land animals is terrible the way that land animals are dying can be atrocious with fish, I mean, you can do whatever you want to a fish and you're not going to yeah. get put in jail for it. In many states and, and countries around the world, they don't even make it into the definition of animal, um, which is kind of mind-blowing. Um, in some of the legislation in Australia, they, they, de they define a vertebrate uh, from the perspective of the legislation. Uh, and, you know, in three of our states, fish aren't classified as vertebrates. Um, which is just completely mind blowing. And in fact, one of in one of our states, the Northern Territory, it's actually a, a territory as opposed to a state, but mm -hmm. um, they have this weird legislation where a fish is included in their animal welfare legislation if it's in captivity, but if it's in the wild, it's not. So if you went and caught a fish that has no rights, but you take that same fish, bring it home, and put it in an aquarium then it's protected by animal welfare legislation. So more often than not, the definitions in animal welfare legislation around the world has absolutely nothing to do with science. Mm. Uh, and it's mostly about convenience because otherwise we would basically have to prosecute all the commercial and recreational fishing people everywhere in the world. <laughs> That's so bizarre. I mean, you'd like to think that the rights of a being is based on their capacities, their capacity to suffer, their sentience. But in that mm -hmm. scenario, the capacity is exactly the same and we're basing it on like the location or, or whether or not the, the human owns them, I suppose. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think the Northern Territory legislation is about duty of care. <laughs> so if you, if you have a duty of care to look after a pet once it's in your control, mm. then that individual has rights and can suffer and is sentient. Mm -hmm. But in the wild, it's not, which... I mean, I can understand it mm -hmm. if you wanted to protect the fishing industry from prosecution. That <laughs> totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very practical approach uh, to a problem that nobody wants to solve. Mm -hmm. And the, the legislation kind of, I mean, there seems to be a, a two-way relationship between the legislation and the public perception, I suppose. The public perception of fish, I mean... How off is it? And in, in what different scenarios yeah. are, are, they, are they off? What topics and, and what capacities are we, are we getting confused about here? Uh, well, just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start? Uh, look, I mean, what, what my feeling is that generally speaking, um, people develop empathy for animals if they believe the animals um, are intelligent to some extent. Um, if you start talking about sentience, you kind of lose people because, mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, sentience is quite a difficult concept to grasp. Um, and for most people, they don't have the time of day to figure out what that means. But if you start telling people, for example, that they're, they're intelligent animals, that they, you know, what some of their capacities are, um, if you can tell them that, for example, they can feel pain and, and suffer, they can be and um, suffer from anxiety and stress and these kind of things, then people can start to kind of relate to it. That's more, more something that, you know, that, that they feel themselves and, and therefore they can understand what that might be like. So I think if you, if you start to break down those sorts of barriers and you tell people, well, you know, fishes are, are really smart. Uh, there's a whole bunch of smart things that they can do that are, pretty much indistinguishable from land animals and 
you know, they, they're cap capable of stress and anxiety. If you went in to the to the hospital and got a cortisol kit, which measures stress, you know, in people, you can use exactly the same kit and measure stress in fishes. So, I mean, that again talks about the common mm -hmm. physiology and that sort of thing. And when you make those kind, you have those kind of discussions, and I think people start to realise, oh, you know, maybe we should be paying more attention to to fish welfare. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there's this perception that fishes are unintelligent? How did that start? I, look, I have no idea why. Why do we think that they're stupid when you know if you spent five minutes watching them? Um, even in a fish tank at home, when I was a little kid, I had a pretty decent sized fish tank. And even now I have a six foot fish tank in my lounge room. Mm -hmm. Most of my fishes are, are tiny and, you know, it's a whole, whole world for them down in, in that fish tank. But even as a little kid, it occurred to me that the fishes only ever responded to me because I was the person that fed them, you know, every day. Um, not only did they only respond to me, but they knew the time and the place where I was going to feed them. They could predict what mm. was going to happen. So even as a little kid, maybe four or five years old, I knew instinctively that the fish knew what was going to happen every morning and every evening, and they knew where they needed to be in order to get food. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, even as a little kid, it was pretty obvious that they were way smarter than, than people were saying. I mean, mm. at, when I was that age, it was pretty common for people to say that you know you've got the memory of a goldfish which is mm -hmm. to say it's two seconds or five seconds or ten seconds or whatever it might be and in fact until fairly recently we still had advertisements on tv that kind of poked fun at the fact that fish have two second memories mm -hmm. so that that's still i think deeply embedded in public perception and, yeah. and i cannot for the life of me figure out why that might be well, other a... than Sorry, can sorry, carry we on. Might, other than the fact that maybe it makes us feel better about putting goldfish in tiny goldfish bowls or something. I mean, I, it really it blows my mind. What's interesting is that if we have these misconceptions about intelligence because we're not interacting with fish at all or enough, well, that kind of contradicts what you said earlier about the about how they're the most common pets and they're everywhere. We have so many of them in fish tanks, so it seems that humans are interacting with fishes a lot. But it's not enough. People aren't. We're disengaged. Right. Maybe we're not, we're not yeah. interested. Not everyone was as interested as you were when you were looking at the fish. Yeah. And I think the other thing, interesting thing, even though fish are, you know, crazy numerous as pets, if you think about what we often refer to that, it's often called the ornamental fish trade, which means that fish are an ornament. Mm. You know, they're not, they're not a pet. It's like mm. having a, you know, a vase of flowers on your on your cupboard or, or mantle or what have you, you know, mm. they're there to look pretty and to move around and kind of soothe and calm you. Mm. But um, I think it would be fair to say that most people don't interact with their pet fish in the same mm. way as they do with other pets, um, which is a shame because actually you can teach them to do all sorts of cool things. And if you spend five minutes on the internet, you'll find some really cool videos of people training their fish to swim through hoops and score goals with soccer balls and all sorts of cool things. Mm -hmm. um, but people just don't take the time to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess our language reinforces our perception of them having low intelligence and, and low sentience. But it's a really difficult question to say, is, is, is the language because of how we perceive them or is, is the language causing? I mean, I suppose it's probably a bit of both, but I'm not going to ask you that question because it seems like an impossible one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but if, again, I mean, if you think about the language that we use for, for the commercial fishing, they talk about harvests and things mm. like that, as if they're going out and mowing a field yeah. of wheat. You know, mm. we don't count individuals. It's, mm. it's in tons. Yes. Uh, and so it's, I think there's a real disconnect um, between what happens on land, which we're familiar with, and what happens in the ocean which, you know, I think historically we used to think was a whole world that we didn't understand. Fish stocks were basically endless. Humans could never have a big impact on the ocean because it's so vast and enormous. Um, of course, that's no longer the case. I mean, if we chose to, we, could, we have the technology now to literally catch every fish in the ocean if we chose to. Mm -hmm.
don't tell people that, Colin. Don't tell people that. Well, I think they know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cost effective to do. Yeah. Um, when it comes to pain perception, now I remember when I was younger being told, I can't remember who told me this, but I remember being told that they're cold blooded and therefore can't feel pain. I only went fishing once in my life. I went with a friend. I didn't know what I was doing and I kind of watched. But I didn't empathize with the animal because I didn't think they could feel pain. I guess I, I wasn't even recognizing that they might be conscious, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pain perception, I suppose our, our, the public perception of their ability to, their capacity to suffer and feel pain is a real problem if, we, if we're trying yeah. to change the way we're treating these animals. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, to be honest, it has absolutely nothing to do with whether they're cold-blooded or warm-blooded. Um, in fact, there are a whole bunch of fishes that are warm-blooded. Um, a lot of the tuna and, and, and those sorts of things are, are, are exercising so much that their body temperature is well above ambient. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason that they um, can swim and are such awesome predators is because they're, they're, they're basically keeping their body and, and particularly their brain um, well above ambient. Um, so it has absolutely nothing to do with whether you're cold-blooded or, or not. Um, I think that's kind of a catch-all, you know. Basically, we care about birds and, and mammals because they happen to evolve uh, endothermy, both of them independently, by the way. Um, and birds, of course, are derived from um, dinosaurs and lizards. So... You know, do we care about lizards? Well, you hardly hear anything about <laughs> the welfare of, of lizards, but they're well and truly entrenched uh, in terms of the, the welfare definitions of what's an animal and what's not. But in terms of pain perception, pain perception's actually got to do with nociception to start with. That they're the, they're the, the nerves that detect noxious stimuli, any, any kind of pain or you know, a change in temperature or chemistry or Mm. pest pressure or, or what have you and in fact nociceptors date back to the annelids so that they have been around for like a billion years <laughs> i want to say i want to say eight or nine hundred million years uh into from an evolutionary perspective so they've been around for a really long time which means that most invertebrates that we deal with on, on, on a day-to-day also have nociceptors which means they're capable of detecting not just stimuli um, the question about pain itself is actually, it's more to do with how you analyse that information. Um, basically, it's about emotional responses to those noxious stimuli. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for a long time, we used to think that only adult humans or at least people who could voice uh, their concerns about pain were capable of feeling pain. I mean, it's surprising. Like you don't have to go far back. Twenty years ago, people used to think that uh, human infants didn't feel pain because they couldn't verbalize, um, you know, their response to pain. And even today, you know, if you go to hospital and uh, you've broken something or you, you know, you've been kicked in the head or whatever, what do the nurses and doctors say to you? That they say, "How do you feel on a scale of one to 10? I mean, that is literally how we measure pain it's not quantitative at all Mm -hmm. um to this day there is no way to quantify how humans feel pain let alone how anything else feels pain and it's the same problem right because we we can't get inside people's head and if and if i take a pin and i prick you in the finger and i take the same pin and prick somebody else in the finger we all respond uniquely so it's it's no wonder there's no standard and no way of measuring it so it's seriously problematic um, that we can't measure it for people and I think to be honest the further we go away from people um, in terms of you know form um, physical form the harder we find uh, to relate to them and the less inclined we are to empathize with them and the less we are inclined to believe that they can feel pain Mm -hmm. but we've known about nociceptors in fishes for more than 20 years so and uh I think the, the, the evidence for pain perception, psychological and, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, from, from a cognitive perspective, mm-hmm. probably 10, 15 years we've known about that. And ever since that time, it's just got better and better. 
I suppose ever since I've been an adult, <laughs> it's been obvious to me that, that fish fishes feel pain. I suppose from an evolutionary perspective as well, it just makes sense that they would. But how common do you think it is, uh, the idea that they they don't feel pain? Is, is it sort oh, of... Oh, really common. I, I Honestly, I, I think if you stopped and spoke to people for long enough, it wouldn't take long to convince them. Hmm. Um, and I do that kind of thing all the time. I give lectures in all sorts of... Um, public contexts and the people are shocked and their eyes open and they come up to me afterwards saying if only we'd have this conversation you know 20 years ago or why haven't I ever thought about this or whatever and I seriously that's what I think it comes down to people just have not seriously thought about it and in fact the only reason you and I feel pain in, in the way that we do is because again we inherited all that mechanism from our fishy ancestors because we're fish. I, yeah. Because we're fish. <laughs> <laughs> if someone came into the conversation now, they'd, they'd think we'd like taking some LSD before we started talking. <laughs> <laughs> What's in your coke? <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a bit about recreational fishing. We seem to not see fishing as hunting. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about this? Like, why, why are we seeing this distinction here? What's going on? I have no idea what that's about, but to be honest, the political arm in Australia is called the Hunters and Fishers Party, right? So even the the, pol- the political party separates hunting from fishing. But, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you ask somebody a blunt question, is hunting is fishing a form of hunting? I think if, if anybody thought about that for more than a minute, they'd say, oh, yeah, well, of course it is. But what we don't do is get you know federal and state governments doing education programs in schools mm. saying go out there and shoot some pigs or something like that you know <laughs> but we do get that from fishing so recreational fishing is actively pushed uh, in the communities mm. uh, on our kids and everybody it's encouraged um, in a way that hunting would never be i mean i would say the vast majority of people are anti-hunting uh, but the vast majority of people have never thought about fishing in the same way. Yeah, the anti-hunting apart from the majority of animals on Earth, <laughs> the fishes. Yeah, the, the most diverse uh, and the most numerous. <laughs> <laughs> and we romanticise fishing, and it's seen as a, a very good bonding experience for a father to do with his son. Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine if we were doing the same thing to land animals? Yeah, well, there wouldn't be much left. Well, I mean, to be honest, there are still places. Like if you go to, to Italy, we have, we have a, a place in Italy because my wife's Italian, and there's nothing left there because shooting is such a popular pastime there. I mean, there is nothing. Um, mm. The birds, what few of them are left, are terrified. So, you know, you can't get within 100 yards of the bird before it vanishes. Mm-hmm. And so there are places that hunting, where hunting has literally destroyed everything because mm. it's is it, well, it was popular now there's not much point in going hunting because there's nothing left um but on the whole i think um yeah fishing is romanticized but it, you don't have to go all that far back um where hunting was kind of romanticized in the same way you know mm. all the kings and and queens in in europe had massive areas of land set aside just so that they could go hunting right you know the mm-hmm. hunt was the big thing and, and in, in the uk i think um amongst the upper classes the, the fox hunt is is still a thing right yeah um so you know it wasn't that long ago that i think hunting generally was kind of romanticized but fishing still definitely is and i think for the same reasons about going out and getting in the wild and bonding mm-hmm. with nature i don't know how you bond with nature by killing stuff but <laughs> apparently that's what you do um but look, I, I have to confess, when I was a kid, I quite enjoyed sitting on the bank of the river and just watching the world go by, right? Mm. I mean, how often do you find an excuse to do that? And to be honest, fishing is one of those things where you can. It's just an excuse to sit there and do nothing. And I don't know, I don't know how popular this perspective is, but um, I, I think there are a whole bunch of people who go fishing and don't really care one way or the other whether they catch a fish or not. Mm-hmm. It's all about yeah. the experience and, you know, having a few beers with your mate and, you know, being quiet and watching the world go by. Mm. I think it's an alternative to yoga or something. Right. 
it seems that fishing is is connected with comes with all these other experiences that are great and that don't necessarily hurt anyone which is fine yeah. but maybe if you start yeah. saying to your mate like the people who go fishing if they're going to say like oh do you want to go and just sit while <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to sit and watch the world yeah. go by and do absolutely yeah. nothing yeah, I, you know, I think if you if if you said that to your mate in Australia, they'd be like, yeah, okay, maybe not. <laughs> mm. so maybe we need to <laughs> definitely design... not a blokey yeah. thing to do. Right. Yeah. Maybe we need to kind of create some other thing that people can do that's kind of like fishing that doesn't harm anyone. Yeah, like go for a picnic or something. I yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And then of course there's that whole uh, you know fishing competition thing where. People try to catch the biggest fish on the smallest line and stuff like that. Mm. I, don't, I really don't understand that at all. Uh, that's kind of weird. Um, I've heard some people say, in response to the ethical arguments against fishing, that they they catch them and then release them. Mm. I mean, do you think do you think that's ethical? Do you think that's more ethical? What is that a, a good argument to make for for it being ethical? Oh, well, look, I mean, one of the problems with fishing is that you never know what you're going to catch. And maybe that's one reason why people like it, because it's a bit of a lucky dip. Um, but that does mean that you have no idea what's going to end up on your line. And to be honest, if you watch most of the guys who are fishing down the pier, they throw most of the stuff back because it's either undersized or it's the wrong species or what have you. So even if you come back with one fish after a day of fishing down the pier, you've probably caught 10 or 15 things that you've had to throw back. And all you've done there is inflict needless stress and pain and anxiety on animals. So I don't really, I don't really understand it from that perspective. Fair enough if you can go down, like if you went to, you know, places in Australia where there are the trout have invaded and killed all the native species. The only thing you're going to catch is a trout. Mm. Um, then I, I don't really mind people catching a trout and killing it and taking it home and eating it. I mean, I don't really have a problem with that as long as you do it humanely. But any other form of fishing, I think, is it's pretty hard to justify. Um, and catch and release, I mean, maybe from an ecological perspective, um, you know, it, it might be better to mm -hmm. put a fish back in the water and, and let it live. But, um, you know, I think from an ethics and welfare perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense mm. so there's a bit of a there's a bit of conflict there and then of course you've got to ask the question what's the probability of this animal surviving after it struggled on the line and you've damaged it and, and so on and i suspect that the statistics for that are you know reasonably low so mm. you know unless you're using barbless hooks or ring hooks and knotless nets to land the fish and you, you don't bring it out of the water at any point um, then the chances are the stress, the anxiety, and the pain um, that you've caused to that animal, it's going to die anyway. Mm. Um, and fishes are really susceptible. So if you remove, you'll notice that they're kind of slimy when you handle them, and that's because they're covered in a mucus, and the mucus protects them from all sorts of um, infection, particularly fungal infections. And if you disrupt that in any way, then they are susceptible to, to infection. So mm -hmm. basically handling wild fish is not a good thing for the, from the fish's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess fishing in general probably is, is not a good thing from the, from the fish's perspective. Nah. But I mean, even if, if we talk about that, that one scenario with the trout um, where you catch them and then um, kill them and then take them home and eat them, given that we're catching them, I guess, with a huck uh, through their mouth or, the, or their lips, I mean, can that be humane? Can, can fishing, can doing that to a, to a being be humane, do you think? Yeah, well, look, I mean, probably there are better ways to do it, right? And, and we are developing better ways to do it. Um, but wild captured fisheries of any description is always going to be difficult from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, people argue that because it's a wild fish, it's had a happy life. Um, and, you know, if you catch it and bring it in fast, then it's probably experienced pain and anxiety for a minute or two. And if you kill it quick, um, then it's, it's a reasonably humane way to go. The only way really to prevent any kind of um, pain is to stun them, and you can't do that with wild capture. Mm -hmm. You can do it in an aquaculture context, but you can't do it in a wild capture context. Mm. Um, unless you had, I don't know, sectioned off a stream and you literally stunned a whole section <laughs> of the stream. 
killed everything instantaneously. Uh, of course, that's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, the ultimate aim when you're killing animals for any reason, whether it's because they're sick and dying or what have you, is to try and do it in such a way that they don't feel pain, that they don't suffer. Mm. Uh, and really the only way to do that is um, to stun them and render them unconscious, whether you do that chemically or mechanically or electrically or whatever. Um, it's really the only way to do it. And it, it's, it's basically impossible to do it in a wreck fishing context. And mm-hmm. I would argue in a commercial fishing context, it's impossible. Yeah, I mean, what comes to mind is that um, when I was talking to Temple Grandin in my last ep- last episode, she was talking about CO2 um, gas chambers and pigs and how depending on the breed of pig, it's it's different and you might need to use different amounts of the CO2 and it affects them differently. Well, with fish, you don't know what's going to come up. And it just, just because you can maybe be able to you stun one animal doesn't mean you can be able to stun all the others. And there might be issues of them regaining consciousness depending on yeah. how, how old they are or what species. Like, it's so complicated yeah. here. Um, it's complicated. And you but, can't use CO2 because fishes are acutely um, sensitive to CO2 concentrations. So hmm. you can't do that. You can't put them on ice um, because all that does is slow their metabolism down hmm. uh, and it can prolong death as opposed to, you know, hasten it. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's seriously problematic. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as we've mentioned repeatedly, there's such massive diversity out there, you know, 35, 36,000 described species, about 200 new species described every year, mm. and probably just as many that are currently undescribed. The diversity is insane. So you, you could not, uh, in the same way as we do for mammals, there is no one single best way for handling and killing fish. Mm. It's impossible. It has to be species specific. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, later about commercial fishing and farming but before we go into that i want to talk i want to sort of go through some of the evidence for why these these perceptions about intelligence and sentience why they're wrong so maybe we should talk about uh, fish memory first so what what research yeah. can you can you tell us about fish memory and why it's why it's better than simply lasting five seconds <laughs> yeah well you know my first uh, serious science experiment uh, was during my honors and what I, I, was, I was actually teaching a course about fish and fisheries back in those days, and I used to have a, a trawl simulated in a, in a really big fish tank. And I, mm. basically I was trying to show the kids, you know, this is how the fish respond to trawls. This is how the escape routes, you know, for, for avoiding bycatch work and, and, and things like that. And what we noticed during those um, a couple of hours that we did with the students is that the fishes just got better and better at avoiding the net every time I had a new prep class come in. And so during my honours, I actually started measuring the time that individual fish escaped through the escape route in this mm-hmm. trawl net. And what I found is that it improved dramatically over the course of about five runs. And what I did then is I put those fish aside and I tested them almost 12 months later, 11 months. I couldn't do 12 because I had to hand my thesis in. Um, 11 months later, I tested them and they carried on as if it was the same day. So not only did I show rapid learning in fishes, but that long-term memory um, was astounding. Mm. Uh, And that at the time was one of the best evidence of long-term memory in fishes ever shown. And not surprisingly, it got published in a pretty good journal. Um, apart, at that time, really the only other evidence of long-term memory in fishes was about hook avoidance, ironically. So people had done some experiments in the 70s uh, in, in ponds with fishes that were tagged of known identity. And they found that um, if you captured fish on a given lure, uh, they would avoid that lure for basically 11, 11-ish months, almost a year. Mm. So that, that, that was a really interesting finding in that I wasn't inflicting pain on my animals at all. Um, yeah, they got a little bit stressed because the net was going to come in and catch them and they got confined to a, a small space at the end of the tank. But there, there was no pain, but it, it was clearly a, you know, a reasonably stressful experience initially mm-hmm. for them. But they found the solution and they were highly motivated to find the solution. 
and, and I suspect that that sort of negative feedback uh, really was a, a strong driver of enforcing long-term memory. And you often find that, that you know, negative, you remember ex- negative experiences for mm. really long periods of time. <clears throat> so that, that was, I think, it got a lot of press, of course, because you know, memory and fish, holy crap, cow. But, <laughs> I mean, that was in the, in the mid to late 90s. Um, by the time it was published. Um, so at that time, it was kind of mind-blowing. But it, despite the fact uh, that at the time, you know, it got a lot of media coverage and what have you, every time after that that we showed learning and memory and fishes in all sorts of different contexts and shapes and forms, we basically had the same response from the media every time. <gasps> Fish can remember stuff. And, you know, at that time I used to have a catchphrase that it was the media that had a short-term memory problem and not fishes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. uh, look, I think um, that really put that question to, to bed, uh, rapid learning. Uh, and the other thing that we did with those that same experiment is looked at different group sizes and we found that larger groups of fishes could solve the problem faster. Um, and that led me into a whole world of investigating social learning in fishes. So that's how they learn by interacting and observing one another. And in fact, I, I moved from the University of Queensland to Cambridge and started working on just social learning. So I went and joined a comparative psychology lab um, at Cambridge. And there were people doing work on, on monkeys and, and birds and all sorts of stuff. And there were a few of us, well, you, me and somebody else <laughs> working on fish. Um, and initially everybody's like, ah, what are you wasting your time on fish for? But uh, we soon showed them that actually it was way more effective to study social learning mechanisms in fish than it was uh, in monkeys or anything else because it was just so much easier to work with fish. Mm. Um, And in fact, some of the primate and indeed some of the bird PhD students ended up doing projects on fish because they'd noticed something happening in their primates, Mm -hmm. but they couldn't manipulate um, the primates in the same way as they could with fishes, nor could they get the the replications. Uh, And so they ended up working with fishes. And I think we we really proved in that context that that fishes were a fantastic model for understanding all sorts of uh, cognitive um, things, learning, memory, uh, later, we started working on personality and, and all sorts of things. So mm. they really were a fantastic model. And I think that's now universally recognized in, in science and psychology. And it's interesting, I suppose, for you, when you were studying all of this, it was probably intuitive that, that you'd be finding that there's lots going on here. Uh, but, but the research, I guess, maybe wasn't there to back you up because people hadn't been interested in it previously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and there was, it was interesting, if you, if you go back and look at the German and, and indeed Russian literature, they'd been studying learning and memory in, from a comparative perspective for a really long time, you know, 40s and 50s kind of stuff. Um, but we just didn't have access to that literature. And in fact, during my honours, I was constantly having to write to authors in those countries having their papers posted over. This is before the internet, right? And then I had to have them translated. Wait, wait, we haven't always had the internet. <laughs> God, what? what? <laughs> it was insane. Back in those days, you used to have to, you used to, have to send a, a little card in the mail to the authors or, or to the publishers and they would send you a hard copy of the paper. Yes. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, how did we achieve anything back wow. in those days? Yeah. Wow. So of course, now, gosh, if I don't have access to a, you know, to a paper within five seconds, I'm not interested. All, all this access to information, the wealth of information, and the same misconceptions about fish still exist. <laughs> Scary, right? Yeah. I mean, you could literally, anybody right now could get onto Google or, you know, anything and read half a dozen papers uh, that would solve that issue. Mm-hmm. But we can you tell us maybe of some interesting research about the, the social interactions between fish, the social learning perhaps? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the cool things about studying um, social behaviour in fishes, I mean, everybody knows fish school, right? I mean, that's like a standard thing. You see schools of fish all the time and on all the documentaries and things, and they do kind of amazing 
whirly roundy things like in the same way as flocks of birds to kind of mesmerize him. Mm. Um, one of the things that interests me pretty early on was whether or not fishes could actually recognize one another. Um, and it, it matters because if you think about you know, what we know about hierarchies in animals, the only way hierarchies can work is if you know who's who, right? Um, hierarchies were really well studied in primates and chickens and various things, particularly chickens because they're just so easy to work with and they have a very, very structured hierarchy. Everybody's heard of the pecking order. Mm -hmm. So they, they only really work uh, if you're capable of recognising one another. And when I was doing my PhD, nobody really understood if fish could do that. Uh, and so we started doing some really simple experiments where we put random fish that had never seen each other before in, into groups and housed them in, in aquariums together. And we asked, well, if you give them a choice between hanging out with their, those individuals that they've been you know, familiar with mm. versus a bunch of strangers, um, do they show a preference for hanging out with the individuals that they recognise? And the answer to that is, yeah, they do. <laughs> it takes about seven to 14 days for them to become familiar. Uh, and over that time, their preference for hanging out with familiar individuals goes up and up and up. And in, indeed, you can, some fantastic experiments were done um, at the University of, of Glasgow where they showed that even if you separated those familiar fish in, and kept them in isolation, um, if you tested them 20 days after 20 days of isolation, they still showed a preference for familiar individuals. And we now know that they can use vision and, and chemical cues and behavioural idiosyncrasies to, to, to identify mm. individuals. Uh, and, in fact, they can not only identify individual fish, but they can identify kin, so, how, you know, related individuals. They can tell them apart. Um, so I think that started to blow a few people's minds. Um, but yeah. if you look at the way many of the schools and schooling behaviour worked, um, the structure looks very similar to what we see in, you know, in uh, other social animals. And so I guess, you know, in hindsight, it shouldn't have been surprising to anybody that they mm -hmm. were capable of recognising each other. And, in fact, there's been some really cool research recently using archer fish, which are a, a native Australian fish, uh, looking at human face recognition. And the archer fish can tell people apart. Uh, and, and in fact, if you teach them to recognise people front on, you can even rotate an image, you know, 90 degrees and do a, a profile and they still recognise and differentiate between human faces. How exactly can you tell that they're recognising the human face? Well, the same kind of thing that you do with any task. When you, when you basically, when you ask a, an animal to do something or to tell you something, you, there's a fair bit of training involved. Mm. So what you do typically is you have a face that you train them to recognize and every time that face shows up you give them a food reward mm -hmm. um, so it's positive reinforcement basically you could do the same thing with shock if you wanted to but it's not a very nice way to train animals sure. um, so you can do that and you can train them to positively respond to certain individuals and you can say well if i give you a choice between individual A and individual B, which one are you going to approach in the expectation you're going to get a food reward? Uh, and you can get them to choose between two individuals or three individuals or five individuals or 10 individuals or 20 individuals or what have you. And then you can retrain them to, to recognise other different individuals. It's a long process. Um, but at the end of the day, fishes, we now know, can not only recognise each other but they also recognize and differentiate between human faces which makes me feel good because when i was a kid you know as i mentioned at the start i used to think that the fish only responded to me my pet fish mm. and well maybe maybe that was true mm. yeah I and mean, maybe one of the reasons why people find that research so mind-blowing is that it's there's so much going on there you know it's not just self-recognition but you're suggesting there's like a memory if they're separated for 20 weeks they still remember each other oh, yeah and there's a preference for certain mm -hmm. individuals they want to spend time with. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's a, it, it's suggesting there's some very complex stuff going on there, just like with humans. <laughs> yeah, just like with humans. And in fact, recently we've been uh, stealing the technology about analysing human social interactions and we use social network theory to, to look at complex social interactions in schools of fishes and sharks and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's basically universally the case now that if we apply social network theory to any group of sharks or fishes, we, we find that they have individuals that they preferentially hang out with over prolonged periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's probably, we've probably published five or so papers on different species of sharks um, most recently. And, you know, if you ask anybody, are sharks social? They'd say, oh, my God, no way. Well, some species are. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about some of the, the compelling research, maybe another, another piece of research that typically surprises people um, that suggests there's a lot of intelligence in, in fishes. Well, I think um, probably one of the more interesting aspects of um, social cognition is the development of culture. Now, you know, when you talk about culture, people think, oh, there's no way. And you know, culture is this weird thing that humans do, like, you know, wearing Ugg boots to the beach or something. Completely <laughs> stupid idea, but it's trendy. Um, you know, fashion trends often don't make any sense, right? And, and that's all about um, culture influencing our, our perception and our, the decisions and choices we make. <clears throat> and basically what culture is, is these weird spin-offs in, in behaviour that are unique to discrete populations. And if you go anywhere around the world, you will find that, you know, in different cities that there are different cultural traditions and things like that. Now, it wasn't that long ago that we used to think, thought that, that you know, that was a unique thing to people. Uh, and then people started paying attention to chimpanzees. These things nearly always start with primates because primates get a lot of attention. And they noticed that different populations of primates were using tools and various other things um, in, in you know, discrete, unique locations. Uh, and it turned out that, oh, well, yeah, okay. So at, at that time they called it proto-culture because animals couldn't have culture, right? So it was proto-culture. <clears throat> and kept the primatologists happy and the anthropologists happy. Um, but the reality is it turns out that culture is probably a unique byproduct of social learning. And we know that social learning is widespread in the animal kingdom. So after, the, after they found it in uh, primates, you know, think of things like termite fishing and cracking nuts with anvils and, and things like that. Um, they also found it in birds. Uh, of course, the birds always follow the primates because you know, after primates, birds are really heavily studied. Um, and they found, for example, that, you know, different populations of the same species of birds uh, had unique songs, right? They, they shared songs and, and those sorts of things. Um, in New Caledonia, they found that the crows were, were building tools and things like that, and, and that, that was culturally inherited and um, that tradition developed in, in complexity over time. And, of course, then they found whale songs that were unique to different populations of whales and things like that. Well, it turns out that fishes did the same thing. They also are capable of uh, learning by social learning. We've already sort of discussed that. Mm. But what that means is that information can not only diffuse through populations, um, you know, amongst peers, but it, it can also move across generations. And once social information is transferred from one generation to the next, and the, the copying fidelity between generations is you know, reasonably high, then you can develop these um, cultural traditions in animal populations. And it turns out that um, quite a lot of the movement and migration routes that you see, particularly in coral reef fishes and, and other fishes, are passed on um, culturally. Mm -hmm. um, so there were some fantastic experiments done in the 80s where they translocated entire populations of coral reef fishes to see what would happen to their migration routes and things like that. And uh, if you did a partial replacement, so you took in some, some from one population and put them in with another population, those 
immigrants would then follow the new migration paths by following the other fishes and going off and doing and doing the right thing. But if you completely remove the local population and transplanted some novel individuals there, they had no clue about what to do and they just got lost. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's some pretty compelling evidence that that's probably a, a widespread um, phenomenon in fishes um, and that older individuals are probably and acting in the same way as elephant matriarchs in terms of storing important information, cultural information about feeding locations and hiding locations and spawning locations and things like that. And it's been hypothesized that part of the reason for world fisheries collapse is apart from the fact that we just fish the crap out of the oceans, is that we tend to select um, for the biggest fish and where's the cultural information mm -hmm. stored in, in the minds of the biggest fishes. So once you do that, you effectively, well, it's cultural genocide. <laughs> you basically remove the, the cultural information from the population. Mm. And if, if it's important information like um, spawning locations or something like that, then, of course, that just accelerates population decline. Yeah, it seems it seems to be worse than the human equivalent, which is just removing Ugg boots. <laughs> so yes, a lot worse. Uh, but yeah, yes. I mean, like with with humans, we're so affected by the behavior of everyone else around us. I mean, it's so obvious. And there's lots of experiments, like famous psychological experiments, that show that. Um, but some of the things you you mentioned, like the the migrating behaviors, I suppose these things do have uh, a benefit. So there's lots of benefits either to survival or, or sexual selection. What I want to know is, is there anything that you've found fish is doing because of perhaps because of culture that just doesn't seem to have any survival benefits? But before yes. you answer me, before you answer me, I need to go to the toilet. So, and have a wee -wee. <laughs> oh, break. <laughs> I'll be back in like a minute. OK, sorry about that. I did. I did oh, tell good. you at the start that I've got a bladder of a fish. <laughs> yeah, warning. I guess, I guess we all have, right? Because we all fish. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, you can't go too long out of water, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I want to know... Quirky, yeah. quirky culture. Yeah. Yeah, so, look, um, I mentioned that when I finished my PhD, I moved to Cambridge. And one of the reasons I moved to Kevin Leyland's lab at Cambridge because one of his PhD students had just done this really quirky experiment where she taught um, guppies to swim through either a green door or a red door to find a food reward. <clears throat> and um, basically, it's a pretty simple situation, right? You have the fish on one side of the aquarium. There's a perspex partition separating the other half of the aquarium. And there are two doors that the fish can potentially swim through a green door or a red door and behind that partition there's a food reward. <clears throat> and basically what you can do using positive reinforcement is teach them to repeatedly use the green door or the red door. And um, even more interestingly, after you've trained some fishes, you can then put naive individuals in into the group and the naive individuals follow the, the trained ones. And then you can gradually remove the trained individuals and just it ends up being a load of naive individuals. But even after three or four times after you've done that, after all the original trained individuals are gone, they still show a preference for the green door or the red door, depending on which one you train them for. Now, that is kind of quirky, right, because... Mm -hmm. The reality is the green door or the red door are equivalent, right? You can Either is just as good. What I think is even more interesting is even if you move the foraging patch, the food reward, closer to the alternative door, so in, in actual fact it would be better to use the other door, they still have a cultural, a socially uh, induced preference for the door that they've been trained to. Mm. Uh, so in, in that case... The, the, their cultural preference is actually doing them a disservice. It's costing them time and energy. Like the Ugg boots. To follow the cultural preferences. <laughs> like Ugg boots in the band. I mean, honestly, <laughs> but that was the thing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, thanks for that. That's a nice quirky thing. I mean, it's not related to survival or, or reproduction. Maybe they evolved to copy the behavior of the group for survival and, and reproduction. Um, but and we can all... manipulate it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily always lead to, to the outcomes that do uh, increase yeah. survival rates or, or yeah. rates. So one of the interesting things about social learning or relying on culture is that you know, probably originally there was a reasonable explanation as to, to why that cultural trait developed. Uh, and one can only imagine, at least in the animal world, that there was some fitness advantage to doing that particular behaviour. And the cool thing about social learning is that it's much faster to learn things by copying other individuals than it is to try everything yourself, right? But if the environment changes in such a way that that behaviour is no longer the right thing to do, then you kind of find yourself in, in, in a kind of evolutionary trap mm. in that your behaviour, your cultural tendencies are actually misleading you because you're not updating your information based on reality. Um, and, you know, fashion is a funny thing in people, but in fashion is all about sex icons, basically. You know, some famous singer or model decides that she's going to wear Ugg boots to the awards or something like that, and then all of a sudden everybody's wearing Ugg boots all the time because they want to be like this person. I totally don't understand that. I mean, I, I walk around in shorts and T-shirts and no shoes most of the time, so fashion is completely lost on me, but it's it's one thing that most people can understand from a cultural perspective. Who'd have thought that we'd have talked this much about Ugg boots? Someone <laughs> should do like a count of how many times we've mentioned Ugg boots in this conversation. <laughs> That's probably a record. <laughs> <laughs> this is that's why not I, in the script <laughs> yeah, this is why i like talking to academics because they always talk about the most important things <laughs> that's right. so um yeah. I, I listened to uh, a few interviews that you had with, with other people before this conversation and i heard you talking about an email you received um about a huge cod that had 15 hooks on its lip or something like that and um, basically this person asked you if fish are so smart why is this animal constantly taking my bait and getting hooked? I'm not sure if you can still remember that email specifically, but yeah. would you be able to, yeah. to give you, like, how would you answer that kind of question? Yeah, look, I mean, I get, I get asked this kind of question repeatedly, um, almost always from fishermen. Hmm. They say, uh, you know, I keep going back to the same place and I, I've caught the same fish three times. And... Um, my, my simple answer to that is imagine you're in the forest, you're lost and you're starving and a hamburger drops from the sky. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to grab that hamburger and shove it in your gob, right? I mean, that's what you're going to do because you're starving. And the reality is that wild animals are hungry all the time because there's simply not enough food to go around, right? Humans have trouble relating to that because we can just open the fridge and help ourselves. But the reality is wild animals are in that state. So it actually makes far more sense that the fish repeatedly attacks the bait than not. Mm. That's not to say that, you know, they don't develop a hook shyness or, or what have you. They can do. And, you know, one, one if you speak to fly fishermen in particular or, or even people who use um, spinners, lures, you can't use the same fly and or lure over and over again because the fish learn that, mm. you know, that's not a thing that you can eat. So, that, I mean, that's one of the things about fishing from a technical perspective is that you should be changing baits and lures and things all the time because the fish learn. Uh, and, of course, fly fishermen, a really good fly fisherman will walk around the area that they're planning to fish and look at the sort of insect diversity. You know, what's abundant? Is it a moth? Is it a grasshopper or what have you? And then they'll get out their fly kit and they'll pick something that mimics what's actually abundant at that particular time. And so again, from a fish's perspective, if you're doing that, can it ignore every grasshopper that, you know, comes down past it? No, it can't because it's going to starve to death if it does that. So you know, there's lots of good reasons why fish are repeatedly caught, the same individuals, over and over again. And sometimes, let's not forget, that the fish might be so hungry that it decides that the, the cost, if you like, of having a painful experience of being hooked 
is actually better than starving to death. Uh, and we know that animals do make those kind of trade-offs. Um, there were some classic examples uh, from, let me think about 2005, 2008, where Basically, researchers gave fish the opportunity to hang out with friends or get access to food. But in order to do that, they had to go through an area of the fish tank where they would receive an electric shock. Mm. <clears throat> now, it turns out that fish are so attracted to, to their friends that they're willing to, to get shocked so that they can get access to their mates. Um, because their schooling is a thing. And in fact, if you shock them, their preferences even higher for, for social uh, comfort because that's what fishes often do you know they when you when they're scared or anxious that their, their social preferences in, are enhanced because they like to school that's mm. their their way of dealing with danger yeah just to be clear when, when the, you when you say mates you don't mean sexual mates you mean like friends like the the ones friends. That, yeah. yeah 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 well it could be mates either. yeah i mean but not necessarily yeah did. not no that's right um and when they offered them food if the fish had been starved for more than two days, then the fish decided that the trade-off of getting shocked in order to get access with food was sufficient. Mm -hmm. So they were willing to pay the cost of getting shocked so that they could eat. And so that, you know, trade-off again speaks to why fishes, hungry fishes, even if they know there's a chance that they're going to be hooked, they're still willing to take the risk in order mm -hmm. to get access to the food. Right. So it, it, there's some sophisticated things going on there. Mm -hmm. it just highlights how disconnected we are from the experience of the the individual wild animals who haven't got the the, the fast food and the the air conditioning and the and the supermarkets that we have to make our lives so comfortable. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, I think on the whole, you know, we like to romanticize about um, the life life of wild animals, but it's it's a lot harder out there in the real world than we imagine absolutely yeah that's something that I, i'm keen to talk with you a little bit about about later um, now i want to talk about uh pain since the, the 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 capacity for for fish to feel pain what's one of the most compelling pieces of evidence you've seen for fish having the capacity to suffer and feel pain i suppose that that's kind of a complex question because because maybe suffering is different to pain let's start with pain <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are all sorts of things, right? I mean, suffering, I think, encompasses, it's like a broad umbrella. Mm. Um, you can have anxiety and stress and um, you might be too hot or too cold. Or, mm -hmm. or maybe you're suffering from separation anxiety. Right. You want to be with your mates, your friends, whatever, colleagues. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, a lot of people during COVID suffered from separation anxiety. Uh, and I think if you told people now that there are loads of fishes that suffer from separation anxiety, if you take them away from their friends, then maybe they could relate to that. Um, so, yeah, and look, the, 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 the compelling evidence for pain, look, there are so, so many. And it's difficult to know where to start, to be honest, but I usually kind of step people through it. And, and the first, I guess the first and foremost is that we kind of talked about this already, is that you know, pain is an objective thing, right? So I, if, if you step on something and you, you say, oh, I hurt my foot, I have no idea, really. I have no idea what you're feeling. Mm. Did it really, really hurt? Or is you, you know, you're kind of a bit of a wuss and, you know, you're not really hurt. Um, and I have this conversation with my kids all the time. When they come to me squealing and carrying on, I say, are you going to die? That's the first question I ask. Are you going to die? No. Okay. <laughs> Calm down and breathe. Tell me what happened and we'll do a, a rational assessment. Now, the problem with pain and the reason I have that conversation with my kids is because I have no idea mm -hmm. what they're feeling. Um, and so what you do, whether you have kids or whether you're talking about your animals, is you look at their behaviour and you use the signs and symptoms of their behaviour to inform you whether or not the pain is serious or whether it's, you know, inconsequential. Mm. Um, so people and, and kids and animals that are in pain do a number of things that are pretty obvious to anybody. I mean, crying is an obvious one, right? Um, grimacing with your face is a pretty human thing. But there are other things like, you know, you might go off your food, for example. 
people do that. They lose their appetite when they're, when they're in pain. Animals do the same thing. You might become aggressive or defensive. Um, that's another classic universal sign that somebody's got something wrong with them um, and some sort of psychological or physical pain. Um, people often, and animals, protect an injury. You know, they nurse it or they hide it. Or, you know, if somebody approaches them, they might turn the other way to, you know, to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, again, kind of universal. If you're suffering from pain, you might be distracted. Uh, and rather than doing things that you would normally do, you don't do them. So your priorities and, and the way you, you move about the environment might change. Of course, you could be limping. You might be less active. You might be withdrawn. So that basically there is a massive list of behavioural signs and symptoms. And we haven't even gone into the physiology yet. I mean, you can look at heart rate and breathing rate and all sorts of stuff. If you wanted to, you could measure stress. All of these things are really good signs that an animal or, or indeed a child or a person um, is, is feeling pain. Um, so what we do with animals and with small children is we use those signs and symptoms to tell us a story about you know, whether they're feeling pain, how much pain they're in. Um, and of course, once you start doing that, then there's no question that they're feeling pain. It's just a, it's a question of how bad is it? Mm. Now, some of the very early experiments, um, now after I was at Cambridge, I moved to um, University of Edinburgh and I was in the same lab as Lynn Sneddon. Victoria Braithwaite was um, in head of, in the head of the lab and she's sort of famous. Unfortunately, she died recently from cancer. She was famous for writing a book about um, pain in fishes. And Lynn, to this day, basically spends her life studying pain in fishes. Now, at that time, Lynn was doing experiments. I was still working entirely on, on cognition. Um, but Lynn was in the next lab uh, working mostly with trout. And she was doing some really simple experiments where uh, she would inject a small amount of bee venom into the lips of, uh, of trout, and she would monitor how their behaviour changed. Now, I mentioned all of those sorts of physiological and behavioural measures um, before. She chose a stack of different ones and showed, sure enough, you know, if you inject bee venom into the, to the lips of a trout, they do all sorts of things. They go off their food. Uh, they hide in the corner. They try and scratch their mouth um, through irritation. Um, they become more aggressive and, and all sorts of things. Mm. Um, and the, the, I think the more compelling evidence for that is if you took the same or, or a similar individual and inject it with saline, which basically controls for the handling and the, the pain associated with the injection, you see that those animals recover really quickly. Um, well, the ones that are injected with bee venom, you know, it might be an hour or two before their behaviour returns to normal. And she measured things like activity, breathing rate, how long did it take them to start to, you know, to feed uh, and all, all those sorts of standard kind of things. Um, so those, those were the first experiments. It was really obvious that the fishes responded to the, 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 the bee bite or sting in, in pretty much the same way that a person would. Um, and the next set of experiments was all about, well, what if you start using painkillers? Can you stop the pain and return behaviour to normal, mm. um, similar to the, the, the control where you measure, where you just inject them with, with saline? And um, the thing that worked best was actually a local anaesthetic, which... You know, if, you, if, you're going to, if you're going to treat somebody for a bee bite, which you probably wouldn't, but if you wanted to, the best approach would be just to get a little bit of, you know, local anaesthetic at the site. And sure enough, she found that if you treated the, the site of the injection uh, with a, a local lidocaine, then behaviour returned to normal. So it was, it was pretty obvious from those very early experience, experiments that um, fish not only had nociceptors, uh, so they detect painful stimuli. And incidentally, those nociceptors for all intents and purposes were pretty darn similar to ours. Um, but their behaviour changed in response to painful stimuli in exactly the same way that, that ours would. 
mm. uh, or that any other animal would. Um, and then there are the more sophisticated questions about, you know, how cognitively engaged are they? And then, you know, we already spoke about those complex decision-making um, trade-offs that fishes are making with respect to the, you know, the shock and their access to their friends and their food. So fish are not reflexively responding to pain. Their behaviour changes for the long term. Mm. They show long-term avoidance in, of contexts and situations that have been previously associated with pain. So if, if you, for example, if you divide your aquarium into a, a, a black side and a white side, and you repeatedly shock a, a fish on the white side or the black side, whatever, it soon learns to stay on one side or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's not a reflex. That's the fish learning. And you can wait for ages down the path and put them back in the tank. And yeah, sure enough, they still show that avoidance behavior. And perhaps even more interestingly, if you then confine them to the location where they were shocked, even if you don't shock them, they show stress and anxiety because mm. they're, they're expecting to be, um, you know, injured or, or uh, feel pain in that context. And so that's why, you know, recognising that fish are cognitively, you know, pre-developed and, and complex, um, it's pretty obvious that they can, you know, anticipate and remember things for long periods of time. And those that negative reinforcement uh, associated with, with painful events is, is part of that. They recognise contexts in which they, they're likely to be um, experience painful things in the future. Uh, so that's, that's an important component to it as well. So I, I would argue that the evidence we currently have for pain perception in fishes is just as good as it is for any mammal. Um, and currently, I would say it's better than it is birds right yeah I, I find that that research you've just gone through really compelling you know especially with the, the bee venom the fact that we can do something to them that creates a, a very obvious change in behavior and then you can give them something that that we would see as pain relief that then returns them back to the to the normal behavior mm -hmm. how long ago was it was was this initial research done with the, with the bee venom 2004 2005 a long time ago hmm. but we've known about that for a really long time i think the the thing that's really changed is the level of sophistication um the complexity of the experiments and the things that we've been asking the fish to do now uh well we've pretty much covered off on everything there's basically nothing left to ask <laughs> in terms of you know what fish can and can't do in the context of pain perception uh, the decisions they make and the trade-offs and, and things like that Mm. Um, we even ask how much work are they willing to, to do to avoid painful stimuli? You know, will they swim against the current? Will they choose a, a brightly lit room over a dark room um, if mm. they think that, you know, there's a benefit? There's even experiments showing that if you give them um, access to a, 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 an area where they can self-medicate um, with pain relief, mm -hmm. they'll actively seek that out. Mm. so i mean it it's yeah, as compelling as <laughs> as you could possibly get yeah it reminds me of um one of your papers that i read where the they had the like an enriched environment and uh, a very boring non-enriched environment with no stimulation um, and normally the fish always go to the enriched environment but if you put if they're in pain and you put some kind of analgesic in the in the in the non-enriched environment they choose that um, yeah. but yeah it seems like there's there's so much evidence that's it shouldn't even be a question anymore whether whether fish can feel pain. So let's hope no. it starts to, to filter through to the to the general public and our legislation, which brings us on to, yes. the, to the next topic, which is how we're actually catching wild fish. Can you give us a, a bit of an overview of how we're, we're catching them? How are they dying? Well, look, I mean, it's it, it's it's varied. Hmm. Um, I'm going to start with the best. <laughs> Should we start with the best? Let's be positive. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> The, the best example that I can think of from a welfare perspective in relation to commercial fishing is um, basically the Pacific tuna industry. So these guys, they basically have um, baits on barbless hooks 
they have a set uh, line. There's a bunch of guys in a boat uh, and they're effectively throwing the line over, immediately pulling out the, the tuna. The tuna gets stunned and killed and stored on ice mm-hmm. within moments. The reason that's good is because it can be it can be sustainable, so it's not too bad from an evolu- from a, an ecological perspective. Although you know you want to watch that because it's a high quality product. Um, but the reason why they look after the welfare of the fish is that the, the the product, every individual fish, is worth you know thousands to hundreds of thousands to you know half a million dollars each depending on where it ends up what? right so if it ends up in like the top sushi restaurant in Japan or something like that the value of the product is insane and it's already well established that if you can limit the stress and anxiety that the fish is suffering during the entire process then the quality of the product is actually better at the end of the day um, so there's a heap of research that shows that to be the case. Uh, and so there are restaurants that will not take fish captured in any other way. Uh, so that, that is probably about the best one can imagine. Mm. At the other end of the extreme... But before we go to the, uh, the other end of the extreme, um, I yeah. suppose even if we imagine this this best case scenario, um, the, the, the animal is, is, I'm assuming, feeling like a hook enter through their mouth which we would imagine yeah. does cause it i mean if it happened to me i know it would cause yeah. me intense pain would, yeah. would it, is it any different for the yeah. fish no and i mean it, let's not forget that fishes are physiologically um designed call it or they've evolved for um basically zero gravity right mm-hmm. they're, they're neutrally buoyant in water they are not designed to cope with gravity so even taking a fish out of water into gravity can cause internal damage. Mm. So imagine being taken out via a hook in your face and exposed to gravity simultaneously. Now, fortunately, we are literally talking, in this case, we're talking about literally seconds because the lines are short or the guys catch throw the fish over their head and it lands and is killed and stunned Mm. really fast. So it's over pretty quickly, but that's not to say that there's no pain involved, right? Mm. But it's still, from my perspective, best case scenario for wild fish capture. Right. And I suppose since you said that these, these animals can be, can go for like hundreds of thousands of pounds, maybe even half a million. I suppose we are really talking about a minuscule number of animals yes. in, in proportion to the to the whole industry. So rather yeah. than talking about the worst case scenario, let's talk talk maybe about the majority. What's what's happening yeah. to the majority of, of fishes? Yeah. So the the majority of fishes are actually captured not by hook and line. Um, they're most often captured by some kind of seine net. Uh, and a seine net is effectively a huge net that's dragged behind a boat. And it can vary. It can vary in size. Sometimes it's, it's dragged behind two boats that are separated from one another. So the nets can be massive. They can be drawn um, over vast distances for long periods of time. Um, and it can be set at pretty much any depth. So let's, on average... You know, basically what's happening to a fish in that time. First, it tries to maintain its speed and keep in front of the net. Eventually, it tries to turn around and escape or it's exhausted and falls back into the net. Obviously, that's not a a happy start. (laughs) Once it gets into the net, uh, it can be crushed by the other fishes um, as it's been drawn along. Eventually, the the nets are drawn to the surface. Now, depending on how deep they are, if it's a deep sea trawl, then on the way up, the fish suffer from barotrauma, which basically means anybody who's tried to dive down and your ears start to hurt when you're snorkeling, it's the opposite. 
as you're coming up, the gas inside your body expands and it expands rapidly. And the, the higher you go, the faster that happens. Um, and so it's, it's a terrible, it's a terrible experience because any air bubble of any description inside your body basically explodes. Um, and it can be air bubbles in your circulatory system, in your veins, in your arteries. It could be in your heart. It could be in your swim bladder. Now, more most of the time, or in your stomach, most of those animals have a swim bladder of some description, and the air cannot escape from that swim bladder fast enough, and so it ruptures without doubt. Sometimes the stomach and or the swim bladder um, are forced out through the mouth because there's nowhere else for it to go. Um, and, and so, of course, that is a really horrible experience, as you can imagine. All right, so they get to the surface and the horror story has really only just started because then they're brought, brought up uh, into the air and they're already being crushed underwater. Well, now they're experiencing gravity and the weight, not only of themselves, but all the other fish in the net. And then, of course, they're dumped onto the, the deck of a boat where they're sorted. Many of them are gaffed in the process, so they're literally hooked uh, in, as part of the sorting process. Uh, and a good number of them will suffocate if they're not already dead on the surface of the, on the deck of the boat. To make matters worse, as if it could get any worse, uh, most of those fishes, after being through that trauma, are actually put on ice. And for most fishes, ice just slows down the metabolic rate. It doesn't kill them. So in fact, what you're doing is prolonging the suffering. And a fish might stay alive for two, three hours on ice before it eventually dies, and it dies from suffocation ultimately. So the entire experience is, I mean, from any stretch of the imagination, is a horror show from start to finish. Um, and frankly, if people thought about it, um, you would never eat fish that were captured by a commercial trawler, ever. Uh, not to mention the fact that most of those fishing, obs um, those fishing um, industries are subsidised by government because they're inviable economically without subsidy. Um, so, I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense from a welfare perspective and nor does it make economic sense. Uh, but that's why that industry is failing. Um, we've fished the daylights out of the sea. There's nothing left. And there will come a time where that kind of commercial fishing will, just won't exist anymore. What you've just described sounds like a complete horror show. It really does. I mean, it, it's, it kind of, it, it makes you think that one day perhaps people will look back on this in the same way that we look back on people just burning cats alive uh, or yeah. whipping bears for, for, just for pleasure. You know, it just seems like yeah. so barbaric. Yeah. And, and it is, there's, there's no, there's no two ways about it. And the scale, the scale of the number of individuals this is hap happening to is just yeah. incomprehensible. I suppose this, yeah, is yeah. this is happening to more individuals each year than the total number of humans on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, but like a, by a long way. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we're talking, I mean, this, the numbers are, they're conservative. The numbers we're talking about between one and three trillion individuals, this is based on the number of reported landings by the FAO right, the Food and Agricultural Organisation. So this does not include bycatch, which is massive. Mm. It does not include any of the countries that don't report to the FAO, and it doesn't, report, doesn't, doesn't include any of the boats that are obviously operating black market, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, don't underestimate how huge that is. It's massive. So, you know, I, I would say conservatively, somewhere in the order of five to 10 trillion individual fish would be more like it if you, you know, do a back of the envelope kind of calculation. Mm -hmm. And that's 10,000 times worse than anything we do on terrestrial, in terrestrial systems. 
And this, that's just the numbers and, and the scale of the, the pain uh, inflicted is just off the charts. Yeah, uh, sounds unbearable and doesn't really seem like something I can comprehend. You know, we, we wouldn't, what you've, what you've said sounds awful. But I, when, when you're talking about something this bad, I don't think you can really do it justice because, you know, like we were talking about before, you never know what, an indiv- what it's like to experience what someone else is experiencing. We can tell each other and we can, we can say out, out of 10, how, how painful is it? But we don't really know. And when it comes to that level of unbearable suffering, it's something that most of us yeah. luckily never have to experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's enough to well, keep Those fishes are getting 10 every time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's enough to keep you up at night, isn't it? That, that kind of suffering. Yeah. Since the situation is so bad, do you see any low-hanging fruit in terms of improving welfare regulations for how fishing is currently done? Look, I mean, I've sat around with all sorts of groups of people and and had this exact conversation. And I think that the low-hanging fruit is is aquaculture um, because we have complete control. Um, People aren't out on the high seas doing whatever. You know, I mean, let's let's not lose sight of the fact that we still have slavery operating on fishing boats. Uh, people are still killed and murdered at the whim of the captain. Uh, and so it, it, it's a pretty out there industry. Um, so, I mean, we're not even looking after people welfare <laughs> in many of those boats, let alone fish welfare. So... I, I personally think that that kind of commercial fishing is almost impossible. It's, it's in the too hard basket, um, both in terms of scale, the sort of control that we might have uh, and those kind of things. I think it's just too hard. That's not to say that people aren't trying to solve that. Don't get me wrong. There are research groups in, in Norway and, and Denmark and other places like this where they, they're working on humane ways of capturing fish using trawls. Um, you know, short trawl times, they don't bring the fish out of the water, they don't bring them up fast. When they bring them, they bring them to the surface. They use a massive, basically, vacuum cleaner that siphons them out of the water. So they're in water the whole time and they go into an automated stunning machine. That is awesome, but it's not economically viable. Is it possible? Yes, but it's not economically viable. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you want to pay, you know, a thousand times more than you currently do for the fish at the market. So I think, can we solve it? Yes. Is it viable? No. So I think that, that that's just commercial fishing is off, off the radar. Um, yeah. Let's but do- I, I really think aquaculture is, is where it's at. I think it's the future anyway. We've already mentioned that commercial fishing is kind of dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and aquaculture, on the other hand, is growing exponentially. So I, I suspect that it would be very easy for us, as they have done uh, in the EU, to basically take our terrestrial aquaculture, agriculture um, ethics and welfare legislation and just paste it on top of aquaculture. Um, and that is starting to happen. Don't get me wrong. It, it is starting to happen in, in the EU, not very many other places, but even within the EU, it's been, it's taken a long time for member states to, to enact that legislation. Right. And for, for any listeners who aren't aware uh, of the term aquaculture, it's farmed fish, right? Or we, we're breeding farmed them. Fish. Yes. So can you give us an overview then of the, like the current state? And let's, let's, let's talk about the, the average life of a farmed fish. Well, I mean, it's not very interesting, let's face it. Um, and that's because... You know, the whole idea of positive welfare and enrichment and all those kind of things that we sometimes talk about in the context of, um, you know, pig farming or, or what have you, that, that concept hasn't even make it, made it to fish yet. Um, look, it's, 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 again, it's difficult to put all uh, aquaculture into one basket because mm-hmm. there are some really small family-owned um, businesses which in, in some countries, like Italy, for example, is kind of the standard, uh, where they might have one or two ponds and they're rearing, you know, whatever it might be. At the other end of the scale, you have massive industrialised um, aquaculture that is basically run by multinationals in the same way that everything is these days. 
and in that case, you know, you basically got well, well. Let's let's use salmon as as the example because salmon's probably by volume and probably by um, value, it's probably the most um, important aquaculture um, sector. So in that case, it's, it's an interesting problem because <laughs> salmon have a, a complex life cycle. They start off in freshwater and they end up in, in the marine environment. And so basically they often use uh, hormones to, to get the, the eggs and the, and the sperm from the adults. Uh, they're stripped so that basically they're artificially extracted from the animals. Sometimes that happens under sedation, sometimes it doesn't. The eggs and sperm are mixed and then the fertilised eggs get stored in these big canisters which are constantly got oxygen bubbling through them. And eventually they're laid out in runways uh, where they hatch and they're constantly sorted based on size. Uh, but the density is mind-blowing. I mean, it's nothing remotely like what happens in the real world. The density is out of this world. Um, and eventually they, they get moved into progressively bigger and bigger um, tanks and, and, and things like that. But ultimately what happens is they, they move out to sea, to sea pens. And it's probably the, the sea pens that most people, um, I guess, equate to aquaculture because that's, that's the part of the operation that you can't miss, right? Everybody can see them. Mm. They're basically huge nets. Um, in the in the near shore regions, usually in in, in, bay, in embayments and things like that, and again the density in those nets are astronomical. Um, of course, they're artificially fed uh, a, a huge amount of um, food. Uh, there are ecological problems associated with that because the waste products and, and so on go straight into the environment. But many countries have now regulations about where these farms can be because of the ecological impact on the marine environment. Of course, they, they have problems with parasites, particularly things like sea lice, um, which, you know, when you're keeping animals at any kind of density is always going to be a problem. That doesn't matter whether it's a terrestrial system or a, a marine system, whatever. Mm. Whenever animals are in high density, then there's going to be disease outbreaks. That's just the way it is. So the density is problematic. Um, so the, from a welfare perspective, the life of those animals is not very good. Um, do we have the capacity to keep them healthy? Yes, most of the time we can keep them healthy. Are they happy? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it'll be a fair way down the track before we um, can talk about, you know, positive experience and positive welfare in, in an aquaculture context, but don't get me wrong, we are having that conversation already. How long it takes that conversation to filter into, um, you know, actual production, it's going to be a while, I, I suspect. But we're already developing um, welfare standards for aquaculture, um, which will work in much of the same way that, you know, you know the tick of approval that you get for the RSBCA for your chicken or, or, or what have you. So there will be, um, in the not-too-distant future, um, standards that consumers can look for and know that at least some aspects of the fish's welfare has been taken care of. Mm. Now, people don't often think about that life experience, but, I mean, salmon live for a long time, right? It can be a couple of years before they're ultimately harvested. Harvested, there's that word again. <laughs> sounds like wheat. Um, and, but I think there's there's really good progress now on on that that process. Um, lots of research has been done on how best to extract the fish, how to stun them, how to kill them, how to ensure that they're dead, um, and, and that there's no lasting suffering at the time of of killing. That's not to say that they haven't had you know a pretty boring life. Uh, and, and, but that's that's a good case scenario. There are lots of scenarios where the quality of the life of the fish and the health of the fish is not um, the priority of the of the the um, the industry or, or the particular company. 
Um, and I've seen some really shocking examples of that. Um, you know, dead fish everywhere, fish covered with lesions and, and fungal outbreaks and, and sea lice and, and God knows what else. So it can be, it can be really bad uh, as one would expect when you're um, keeping that many animals in, in such crazy densities. Uh, but look, my hope is in the near future, those um, standards, the welfare standards, people will start to look for them. And, um, you know, when you go into the supermarket and you buy a product, look for the standards. Um, the RSPCA already has some in, in the UK, uh, and there are a couple of others um, that are coming out in the near future. Um, ASC, for example, you know, they have a, uh, what do they call it, a sustainability standard at the moment, but they're about to incorporate a welfare standard with their sustainability standard. So it'll be sustainable and welfare um, uh, orientated at the same time. So I, I suspect that's the future uh, and much in the same way that, you know, we went from caged eggs to, to free range and what have you in the space of, you know, probably three or four years. Um, I was in the UK when that happened. You couldn't buy a, a caged egg in the UK. <laughs> it, went, it happened so fast. And it was dominated by caged eggs and then it, it was free range everything. Um, so that's going to happen, and it'll happen, I think, in the next five, five to ten years. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to one of my friends uh, the other day about before before I had this conversation, talking about fishes, and we were talking about whether we whether we were speculating about whether a fish can suffer from depression. And there was something um, I was one of your articles I was reading where you talk about uh, a fish kind of giving up on life and like sinking down to the bottom. Can you describe that? Was this something that you saw yourself? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a pretty universal thing. And again, this goes back to um, the knowledge that our physiology is fundamentally the same, right? Um, there, in fact, there's a branch of um, ecotoxicology, which is the study of the impact of all sorts of toxic chemicals in the environment uh, on animals primarily. And fishes are widely used as, as the canary for marine and freshwater environments from an ecotoxicology perspective. One branch of ecotoxicology specifically looks at the impact of pharmaceuticals. Um, it's not widely known, but pretty much every time you take some form of medicine, no matter what it is, your body processes some of it and assimilates some of it, but a good proportion of it passes straight out the other side. And yes, our... Um, sewage goes to wastewater treatment plants, but wastewater treatment plants are not designed to cope with pharmaceuticals, which means those pharmaceuticals pass ultimately into our freshwater and or marine environments. And the active ingredients of those pharmaceuticals are often still active. And given what we already know about the conservative nature of physiology, um, it will come as no surprise to people to discover that fishes and other aquatic organisms are deeply impacted by waste pharmaceuticals. The reason I'm talking about this is because we're specifically talking about anxiety. And one of the massive growth industries in the pharmaceutical context is antidepressants. Um, the per capita intake of antidepressants has skyrocketed uh, across the Western world in particular. And which means that the concentrations in our marine and freshwater environments has gone up massively. And I could tell you there are probably 50 or more scientific papers specifically looking at the effects of antidepressants on fish behaviour, and it's not pretty. Um, so those antidepressants have pretty much the same impact on fish behaviour as they have on, on humans. Um, so... We already know that fishes suffer stress and anxiety in the same way that, that, that we do. Uh, and depression can be uh, one outcome of that. Uh, they can also suffer from learned helplessness as most animals can, and that's another sign of, of depression. So, I mean, it's, it's a problem. Most people don't think about it. Uh, but it's a problem that I think that we should think about in the context of aquaculture, but also the aquarium trade. Um, so, you know, you should not keep fish in a boring environment 
with no friends ever. Um, basically, you, sh you should keep them in a, you know, a realistic, natural looking kind of environment, mix it up, keep it interesting and, and make sure that they've got lots, lots of social, um, you know, stimulation. Uh, in the same way as you, you know, you look for yourself, you should be treating your, your um, pet fish in, in the same way. Uh, so I think that's that's a, probably a take home message that people don't take, <laughs> I guess, fish psychiatry very seriously. Mm. But you know, ultimately, if you're interested in the welfare of your pet fish or what have you, then you should be thinking about you know environmental enrichment and, and social enrichment when, whenever possible. The fishes who are just to touch on, on the fishes who are sinking to the bottom and giving up on life. What has happened to them? Is it is it the chronic frustration, not being able to escape with a fish, not having enough space? Is it the lack of stimulation in their environment? Is it all of these? Yeah, look, it can, it can be all of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it's <laughs> look, it it doesn't happen if you look after an animal reasonably well and you provide it with all the sorts of things we're talking about, then it's just not going to happen. Mm. But sadly, I, I dare say most people's first experience of keeping fish, um, they're inadequately, <laughs> inadequately prepared for the experience. Um, the, the aquarium is often too small. The water quality is often not good. Uh, people tend to, believe it or not, overlove their fish. They feed them too much. Mm -hmm. um, fish are not like you and me. You know, their metabolism is a fraction of our own. Um, so they don't need much food and the trouble with overfeeding them is that that food then sits on the bottom and rots and mm. it has a massive impact on the water quality right we can talk about chemistry all day but ultimately what happens is oxygen concentrations decline um, and you get a release of nitrogen and nitrates which basically physically burns their gills so you get a double whammy of reduced oxygen concentration and a reduction in the capacity for the gills to function. So it's a pretty nasty experience for fishes. So that's why water chemistry is such an, an important aspect of, of maintaining fishes. But again, you know, keeping them um, stimulated is really important. And there's some fantastic experiments that have looked at, just as we've done in zoos, the impact of environment enrichment in behavioral repertoire, cognitive learning capacities, and even brain morphology. And, and that clearly shows that if you enrich the environment, a fish's brain um, is stimulated, it's constantly turning over and growing and their behavioral repertoire and cognitive capacity go up. Um, and it can happen rapidly, you know, so you can do something now, if your fish is in a boring environment, you can do something now and within a couple of weeks that, that the benefits of that will mm. have been realized. When it comes to aquaculture, which is, I suppose, where the, the majority of these fishes giving up on life are, yeah. do you have any sense of how common it is? Look, it's difficult to know. I mean, I have um, colleagues that are vets that work for big aquaculture farms. Um, look, it's difficult to say, and mm. it's also difficult to know what the primary cause of many of these things are. I, I would have hazard a guess that the vast majority of time, the primary cause um, is some kind of infection or physical illness or something like that. But let's not forget that your immune system is depressed when you're depressed. When you're, when you're suffering from stress and anxiety, your immune system takes a massive hit. And so again, it's a complicated it's a complicated situation because it's difficult to know ultimately what killed the fish. Was it the stress and anxiety that reduced its immune system and it ultimately died of some fungal or bacterial infection? Or, or was it the bacteria or, or virus that, that killed them? And arguably, you know, it's difficult to separate those two things. But, you know, if they're in a good state of mind and their body is also physically healthy, uh, then that is the best case scenario. For, for any animal and, and for people as well. Of course, you have to keep mentally stimulated and physically stimulated for long life. So it's moving, moving the conversation on a little bit. It seems unusual for a, a scientist to be so involved in ethical debates. 
I mean, uh, it's just for like last hour now we've been talking about ethics. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess given what we're talking about, it's kind of obvious why you've you've drifted into the ethical domain. But I mean, if I have to, if I ask you what what compelled you to to start talking about ethics and raising awareness about fish sentience? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I mean if you looked at my history, it was almost inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't see it coming, don't get me wrong. It's not like I had a crystal ball and I saw it coming. Hmm. Um, but given my past and my empathy for all animals, uh, in a way, those early experiences compelled me to look at cognition, learning and memory because I felt like, personally, I felt that fishes were being grossly underestimated. And I think the more I went down that road, the more I started to think about the fact that, well, geez, these fish are a lot more intelligent than we thought. Uh, and it probably, look, I always, personally, I always thought that they were capable of suffering. So there was never a question in my mind. Mm -hmm. But there came a time when I thought that scientific evidence was so compelling um, that it matched my personal beliefs. Uh, and, and now I think, I mean, geez, the science is so good that there can be no excuse anymore for anybody to, to ignore it. Um, and part of my experience, I came from that cognition perspective. I had that early life exposure to, to fishes. Then I joined the, the, the pain, fish pain lab, mm. although I wasn't there because of my want or need to study fish pain. I was there because we were really keen on studying cognition and the two were obviously interlinked um, and I think Victoria and Lynn both had lasting impacts on me and I still um, write papers with Lynn to this day how long ago was I in that lab I mean 15 years ago or something probably uh, and I still uh, talk with Lynn at least once a month and we've written heaps of papers she's still very firmly down the the fish pain um, road of research and I still prefer the cognition side, mm -hmm. but I suspect our paths have crossed and interlinked so much now that, um, you know, what, a couple of months ago we were both invited to a, a fish welfare conference and she talked about cognition and I talked about pain, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is totally the opposite of what we should be doing. But um, as I mentioned, our, our, our research now is so interlinked that it's difficult to know what the priority is. But I feel like I've worked with fishers for so long that I, I feel a moral obligation to do something about improving their welfare. You can't sit by knowing that this welfare catastrophe is happening around you and not feel obliged to do something about it. I'm wondering if there was a turning point for you. I mean, when you, when you got into this, you were, you were very focused on cognition and you were interested in the science. Was there a turning point or was it a very gradual process that led you towards going down the ethical route? Or was there something you saw where you thought, you know what, that's, I have to do something about this? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think it was a gradual thing. Mm. I mean, it was always, it was always something that I had in my mind. Um, and it was constantly nagging me. But I, I really didn't, I, I didn't really do anything from an academic perspective until I wrote a review in 2014, 2015, which talked about the implications of what we now know, without doubt, about the cognitive sophistication of animals, of, of fishes, and what the implications might be for ethics and welfare. And um, that paper to this day is still one of my most highly cited papers. Um, and I think it was it was just the right time. I mean, the, the evidence by that stage of the cognitive sophistication of fishes was just beyond belief. Mm. I mean, nobody could say or deny that fish were, you know, these automated robots that just did whatever. Um, so there was, I think there came a time where I just thought, right, we really need to think more broadly about what the implications for this is. Mm. And my immediate reaction was welfare because that's what I, always think about and I always have done uh, because of my empathy for animals. Mm. Um, and I think once that paper was published and it, it 
was received exceedingly well. Um, that's when I really fully crossed over into the ethics welfare domain. Um, and I'm still to this day trying to get um, money to, to work on welfare type um, research programs. Uh, kind of trickle along in the background and it's it's a, it's a I guess a, a sad case that it's hard to get money for for welfare um, projects on fishes mm. um, whereas you know I've done pretty well working on cognition in fishes and I've also done really well working on shark and ray behavior because it captures people's imaginations I think and um, fish welfare is I suspect it's still something that people don't really want to talk about. Hmm. Um, it's like everybody's dirty secret, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rather stick your head in the sand. Um, but I, once I made that crossover and after that paper, um, there was really no turning back because I just had so many people coming to contact me to say, can you give a talk in this context to this group of people? And it really went ballistic from that time. I, mean, I guess prior to that, I'd got a lot of airtime on TV and radio and stuff like that in the media generally because of the, the cognition component. Uh, and that really was only compounded once I started talking about ethics and welfare because suddenly there was this whole other part of society that were interested in welfare but had never thought about fish before, um, particularly interested in animal welfare. And, of course, they all embraced me because none of them had any experience in, in fish welfare. And I had so many meetings with various NGOs and goodness knows what else about, you know, how are we going to get the world to respond to this? How do we get the message out? Mm. And I would say that over the last five years, that has been my primary message to the world that, you know, we need to think about the welfare of fishes. We need to do it seriously and we need to do it now. Um, but prior to that, I was really going on and on and on about how cool fishes are and how you know sophisticated they are, and I don't think even that message ultimately got out there as, as broadly as it should have done, um, which goes to show you that you know scientists can only do so much. At the end of the day, what we need to do is recruit people whose job it is to to get that information out into the, the world and, and to change people's minds, mm. um, because frankly, there's only so many people that I can talk to. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm and I, to be honest, most of the time I end up speaking to the converted, people who are already have an interest sure. in, in what I'm talking about. Sure, yeah. I mean, there's in the, the animal advocacy community, there's been a number of documentaries that, that are used to try and show the public what's really happening to animals. But even in these animal advocacy, these, these vegan documentaries, fish aren't there. Because, no. I mean, one of the reasons is because it's very hard, I suppose, to find footage of, of fishes and, and I suppose more importantly it's hard to see that they're suffering in a lot of mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. people don't emotionally respond to it like the, like like they would respond to a pig screaming in pain in the co2 gas chamber uh it's a hell of a ba battle that you've got um but I'm very yeah. very appreciative that you've decided to to head to, towards the the ethical realm because it's clearly needed and it's clearly probably one of the one of the if not the most neglected ethical atrocities of our time yeah i mean if you wanted to 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 put your finger on what would be the number one thing right now that you could do to reduce suffering in the world and it would be fix the problem with fish welfare without a doubt i mean it's thousands of times greater than anything else that's happening in the world right now mm -hmm. so this this next question i'm asking you as a human not a sci not a scientist <laughs> <laughs> what scientists are human <laughs> given what you know about the cognitive capacities of fishes their ability to suffer their, their intellectual sophistication and given what you know about the ways in which they're suffering both through commercial fishing and with aquaculture do you think it's do you think it's ethical to be buying and eating fish if we have alternatives? Look, for me, I don't think there's any excuse for eating commercial fishes. Anything that's captured by commercial um, 
fishing operations. It's just, I mean, it's seriously, it's the worst horror story you've ever heard of in your life. I personally think that there are some, um, we mentioned tuna, you know, if you were going to have any kind of wild fish product, that would be the one that I would go for. Um, it's potentially ecologically sustainable um, if it's managed appropriately. And I think ethically the fishes have a, a pretty good life um, and then they're captured and killed reasonably quickly. And, and you know, everything's comparable. If you, you think relative to what a commercial a fish expo exposed to a commercial trawl operation would go through, you know, that, the contrast is black and white. I, I suspect that we have a long way to go in aquaculture, but I, I do see a future in the not too distant future where there will be aquaculture um, products that have welfare ticks of approval. Mm. Um, so I suspect that if you were going to eat fish in any way, shape or form, there are limited options, uh, very limited options. Uh, and if there are alternatives, by all means, you know, take the alternative. I'm a bit of a, I guess, a pragmatist when it comes to this kind of thing. How often do I eat fish once every three months or something like that? And when I do eat it, it's nearly always a high-quality uh, aquaculture product where I know the welfare of the animal has been taken into consideration. Half a million pounds. So I'm not eating a lot. <laughs> and I nearly always eat it as sashimi. So uh, I, it's not like I waste it and deep fry it so it mm. doesn't taste like anything anymore. You know? I, I really appreciate the product for what it is. Um, do I eat other meat occasionally, but very rarely? I mostly, I think I, I would call myself a flexitarian or something like that. If it's impossible for me to, to be vegetarian, then I, I'll eat whatever, whatever's there. But um, on the whole, yeah, I eat a lot of rice and pasta <laughs> and vegetables and, and that kind of thing. Uh, lots of lots and lots of mushrooms and beans and things like that. Mm. Um, so, look, I, I think that we do, most of us do have an, a, 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 an option to look for alternatives. Um, but I do understand that there are people who choose to, to eat meat. Uh, and as, from my perspective, as long as they're making an informed decision, that they've thought about where it's come from mm. uh, and they're willing to accept that that's the cost you pay for the product that you're consuming, uh, then so be it. Um, yeah, we, we, that might be our, our first little disagreement, I suppose, in the, <laughs> for, from, from my perspective. Um, even if even if someone has thought deeply about commercial fishing, fishing that horror story you described with the ten out of ten yeah. pain. If yeah. someone's thought about that deeply and thought, well, like gone into it, and then they've and they've thought, you know what, I really like the taste of fish, <laughs> and this is an informed, totally informed decision. I yeah. know what suffering. Does that make it better or worse? <laughs> <laughs> Probably worse. I I certainly don't think it it makes it ethical. Um, you know, I think I think. I think that it's a, I think that the right thing to do is to force people to not do things that cause unimaginable suffering to others. Um, yes. So look, I, I mean, I tend to agree with you, um, but the question is a bit broader than that. That is whether or not fish should eat, people should eat fish, hmm. period. Hmm. Um, and I think that there are contexts where the suffering can be reduced, mm -hmm. in which case maybe there's some justification, but I, 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 I actually agree with you that eating commercially caught fish in, in those trawls is unjustifiable mm. in any context. Mm. It seems plausible that any fish product I go out and buy in the supermarkets in the UK, even in the best case scenario, is at the very least probably going to have caused the suffering of, of the fish being pierced through the mouth and dragged out of the ocean. So, from my perspective, the the suffering of, of that individual weighted with the the short lived sensory pleasure I would get from eating them. It just these two things just seem to be in 
two different moral universes to me. Um, but I'd like to, unless you have something to say about that, I'd like to talk a little bit about wild animal suffering. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about academics and, and scientists not really delving into the ethical issues like you do. I have heard a few academics talking about conservation and um, environmentalism, but unlike you, it seems that talk, it seems like it's rare to find someone talking about welfare, I suppose, the, the welfare of the, of the wild animals. Would it be fair to say that the majority of fishes on in the oceans are coming from parents that are having lots of offspring? Is that the most prevalent reproductive strategy that we see? Yeah, definitely. By far and away, the most common strategy is basically the lottery system where you produce heaps of relatively cheap eggs, broadcast them into the to the world and let it go. It's up to chance. Mm. Um, that's not to say that there aren't a good number of individuals that have, you know, live bearers. So they produce you know, live offspring in the same way that we do, give birth to live offspring. And there's a whole bunch of nest dwelling species that, um, you know, look after their young in nests until they're relatively independent. And I dare say that the number of fishes that do those things would be more than all the mammals combined. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just keep a perspective on that as well. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so definitely, definitely the case that uh, more individuals are doing the broadcast lottery system. And from a welfare perspective, obviously, you know, the likelihood of any of those individuals survive is very, very slim. Whereas the, you know, the individuals that are reared or look, looked after by their parents or live birth at a decent sort of size their chances of survival are much higher. It, it seems reasonable then to suggest that the vast majority of wild fishes are dying in infancy because we know that for a population size to remain stable, uh, each parent can only have one offspring on average that, that makes it to adulthood. Um, so this is kind of a, a very um, sort of, it's kind of a scary idea. I mean, we're not, we're not seeing all of this suffering, but it's just like this theoretical reason why it may be the case that they're all dying, most of them are dying in infancy, the vast majority. Yes, well, I mean, look, given infinite resources, which don't exist, mm. um, then I suggest that many more would survive. But uh, look, I mean, most of them get killed by predators and, and the rest are all competing, not only amongst themselves, but amongst all the other animals mm. for access to food uh, and shelter and all these sorts of things. So it's a pretty cutthroat world. Um, but you're right, um, your suffering in the real world is huge. There's no doubt about that. The mm. wild life of, of your average fish is pretty intense and it's pretty short. You know? Although we have, you know, like the Greenland shark, which can live 300 years or 400 years or whatever, the vast majority of fishes, their, their lives are going to be over in days to weeks. Mm. And they... The, the sad reality is that if if the resource if there were more resources, then the the number of individuals would increase until mm -hmm. the natural state of starvation and misery is restored again. It seems to be. <laughs> right. I, I want to I want to to do a hypothetical and, and imagine your ideal world. Say if you were yeah. God, if you were God, yeah. if I was God, yeah. Um, would you like to see? humans working towards reducing the suffering of wild animals so we're talking about we've talked a lot about welfare uh the welfare of the animals we're killing but if the majority uh, of of animals on the planet actually live in nature and we have reason to believe that they're living very short lives full of suffering do you think that i ideally and, I, and then i guess there's two there's two separate questions whether it's bad what's happening to them, which we'd agree, it's like, this is a problem. And the second question is whether we can do anything about it. Now, I want to like jump over that practical question because, because it's such a, a hard thing to do something about it right now. We need far more research and the movement to reduce wild animal suffering is a very fringe movement in its infancy, I suppose. But ideally, I mean, would you, would you like to see a world where we're trying, to, where we're helping these animals suffer less? Yes, but... Gosh, I mean, there, there are much bigger questions. Uh, I mean, the first first thing is, uh, 
you know, why, do, why do we feel pain? And although we've talked about um, death as a sort of end point, hmm. um, you know, pain is a lot more than that and suffering is a, mo- a lot more than that. If you think about stress and anxiety and all of these things, they're actually there to help animals survive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that sounds a little bit crazy, but that's why they exist. Hmm. Um, and if we think about, let's just think about um fight and flight responses, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. when you're faced with a predator, your body goes into shock, your brain goes into shock, but you're pumped full of chemicals that basically prepare you for a fight or or to run or swim or whatever as fast as you possibly can. Mm. Um, And so that that actually is about survival. And, And same with pain. I mean, the reason you feel pain and experience pain Mm. is that you don't go on hurting yourself over and over and over. You actually do something. You change your behavior to make sure that you get better. Mm. And so I would argue that pain and suffering exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. And unless you came up with an alternative way of signaling to the organism Mm. uh, that something's wrong and it needs to change what it's doing, Mm -hmm. Uh, there's not really an alternative. So the, the thing is, I, I'm not talking here about abolishing suffering and abolishing pain. In the same way, if we were to think about humans suffering in the third world, uh, and I said, you think we should ideally help them? I, I guess I wouldn't expect someone to say, well, you know, like if, if we abolish pain, then there's going to be other problems. They might lead to more suffering. It's like, okay, yes, but, but there's, there's got to be a lot of long hanging, low hanging fruit here that we can make to reduce their suffering. Um, Hypothetically, I, I could imagine things like altering ecosystems so the majority of animals are case selected and have a small number of offspring. Having more animals in the wild, like elephants, and less animals like small rodents and insects, if insects can suffer. Um, I, I suppose we don't need to necessarily go to the extreme and say, "Well, you're trying to abolish suffering," because we don't say that in a human case. We still try to, to reduce their suffering. Um, do, you, do you see where I'm, where I'm coming from with that? Yeah, I, I totally understand. But the trouble is all of these different animals that we're talking about with different life history strategies play mm. different roles in the mm. ecosystem. And although they, you think that they are little entities that you can just pull out and throw away, you can't do that because that's not how ecosystems function. Mm-hmm. Everything relies on everything else and everything is interconnected. So mm. if you decided to remove all the case-selected animals that, or the are selected animals or whatever, the system would collapse and none of the animals would exist. Yeah. So and you know, I, I certainly, I certainly can't wouldn't. Be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's just a, a, a crazy hypothetical, like one day maybe, yeah. but like, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we like go into it, it, ecosystems now and start making these huge changes. Uh, I think um, there are a lot of low hanging fruit changes we can make possi- potentially in terms of wild animal suffering harms we're already causing them. You know, we're using insecticides. We can switch to more humane insecticides. We're trapping and killing wild pigeons. We could just uh, use contraception on pigeons. That's, that's one option, perhaps using contraceptives on wild animals so that they have a smaller number of offspring. So they don't all have to yeah. die miserably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I probably use a poor yeah, example. So I, th- I, th- I think that's a good, the good, um, a good argument to have. And one that probably everybody should be thinking about. I think the sad reality, Mm. and I'm always thinking about this from other people's perspective, most of these management, let's call them management strategies about removing pest species or controlling, it's driven by economics. Mm. And at the end of the day, if it's cheaper to shoot a pigeon than, you know, take it to the vet and do some sort of surgical procedure so that it doesn't have babies anymore, I mean, how much would that cost? Mm. Would it even be feasible if you think about how many pigeons there are in the world? Um, there aren't enough vets. There isn't enough time. There's not enough money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but but again, again, I would say we, we go. Are alternatives. Sorry, there's a, I, I literally have to go let this cat in because he's going crazy outside. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, sorry about that. The more I can have the cat indoors, the less likely the cat is to be ripping an animal to shreds outside. <laughs> it's not actually my cat, but I do like it. Um, yeah, I would we, just uh, say... Uh, I, I have would controls just... in Australia for that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I would just say that, um, again, um, we don't need to think about 
giving contraception to all pigeons and, and abolishing pigeon suffering, even if, even, if I, even if we reduce one pigeon suffering, that would be the, the world would be a slightly better place. Um, yeah. I, think, I think it's probably, um, it's so easy to, to think about this more abstractly and, and broadly and like think about solving the problem. I think as humans, we have a, a bias to, you know, we'd, we'd, rather, we'd rather solve a problem 100% to help 10 individuals than save five, like help deal with 1% of a problem to save a billion. And that's not really rational, right? We just care about reducing as much suffering as possible. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say next? Um, I don't know, but I think the concept of reducing suffering wherever possible mm. is something that everybody should be doing and thinking about. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, the the well-being of, of the wild animal is so often forgotten. And, and, we, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about these, these examples that might seem kind of crazy, like contraception or, or changing ecosystems. Um, even though contraceptives have already been used in wild animals, of course, <laughs> um, but so it's not very well known. But um, again, the the question of what we can do, it's it's so hard to to think about that and give good examples when we've never really tried to help wild animals suffer less. Um, yeah. on, on like a right now, we just need to do the research. We need more research looking into the lives of wild animals, what they what they're actually experiencing, um, and yeah. a, a good start, I suppose, something we can do now is just start raising awareness about the, the perspective of the individual and the lives of the wild animals and just wild animal suffering more broadly. You know, the, the, this, this myth that nature is this like beautiful, wondrous thing. Um, it, it's, just, it's just so far, so far removed from reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look, I mean, the other thing to bear in mind is that, I mean, there's lots of things that you can do from a conservation perspective um, that will reduce wild animal suffering. You know, if we can conserve ecosystems and stop acid rain and prevent climate, massive global climate change and all these sorts of things, like all those things are going to benefit wild animals. Is yeah. it indirect? Yes. But um, as a society, I think that's the kind of thing we should be thinking about immediately. Um, can we save the planet, period? <laughs> Second, <laughs> Can we reduce suffering? Mm. Um, I think you know that that would be my priority. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I've you know what we've been talking for like three hours, so I probably should. <laughs> I, I probably I should. Some work. <laughs> <laughs> well, can't we just chat? It's more fun than work. <laughs> it is. But my boss probably won't. <laughs> Um, I really, really appreciate you uh, spending so much time talking to me and um, answering Great. all my, my hypotheticals and uh, going along with, me with all of this. And, and, and I love I, thinking about these crazy mind warped ideas. <laughs> <laughs> these crazy, crazy ideas about reducing suffering. Oh my God. What the heck? <laughs> Absolute nuts. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And I, and honestly, like the, for you coming, uh, like taking your science hat off and coming into the realm of ethics, I think is amazing. And I think uh, I'm just very, I'm just very happy that people like you exist, people who are who are trying to to make things better for these animals because it's it's an issue that is so neglected. And as you say, like the suffering is just the intensity is unimaginable, the scale is is unimaginable, and people aren't doing enough about it. And and people like you are inspiring people like me to to talk more about it. And maybe one day. Um, the world will be, be better and maybe in 10 years time we'll have another conversation and we can talk about how much better things have got if we're still alive. Yeah, the successes let's, let's celebrate the successes <laughs> yeah yeah for sure it's a date <laughs> <laughs> cool um well thank you so much is there anywhere uh, people can go to to find out more about your work and what you do well it's really easy to find out about me because i'm the only cullen brown in the world so if you google cullen brown you find me <laughs> Uh, if you want to find my my lab group, it's the fish the fishlab dot com. So that's pretty straightforward as well. But you know, to be honest, the easiest thing in the world, Google Colin Brown, and you find me. Well, if you're still listening now, then you have made it to the end of the conversation, and I really appreciate that. It's uh, still amazing to me that there's people who are spending hours listening to to my content. I think you'll probably agree if if you made it this far that Colin Brown is someone who has a lot of interesting things to say uh, and someone who's clearly using his knowledge to and, and expertise to try and make the world a better place and I, I find that really endearing and I, I really did enjoy talking to him. It's been one of my favorite conversations so far. <laughs>
If you find my conversations and my content more broadly valuable, then please do consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does make a difference. Of course, let me remind you that I have two channels. So if you've watched this on Humane Hangouts, I actually have another channel called Humane Hancock where I put the majority of my content. Now, since Cullum is 11 hours ahead of me, it's now 20 to two in the morning where I'm from in the UK. So I'm probably going to, to wrap this up and go to bed. Um, wherever you are, whatever time it is where you are, I, I really do thank you for, for making it this far and for watching my content. And I hope you found it valuable and enjoyed it and learned something new. I know I certainly did. Uh, so thanks so much and I will see you soon with another video.